can this get to five thousand. Shade, nice. Love that. Cleaner air, cooler temp. Medicine, awesome. Great job, Arav. Ooh. We welcome everybody, those who are joining in. We're just trying to get to 5,000 products that come from trees. Furniture, very nice, are of drumsticks. Good, timber, excellent. Rope, mm-hmm. Great, fuel, excellent. Water, okay. Heat. Okay. Are people still using paper to write on these days? That's one. Rubber, nice. Just give it a couple more minutes and then we'll start. Welcome to those who just joined and welcome to Katie Lynn. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Val. Hello. Roofing material. So again, we're just trying to get to 5,000 products while we wait for others to, to come in. 5,000 products that come from trees. And right now we're at about, what do you guys think? 4,900. No, we have 4,900 left to go. <laughs> Sidewalls, <laughs> leaves. Great. Dining plates, nice. Really nice, Ara, very good. Eco-friendly products. Even bamboo clothing, I would suggest. Excellent. <laughs> okay, hold on. It's this. Wow. <laughs> Tara, that's right. Love that. Stick to chase and fight. Yes, of course. Toys. All right. It's about five after. Should we go ahead and get started? Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Sure. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for our second session on iTree and Youth. We're really excited to have you. Um, just a few quick reminders. We are recording the session, and we'll make it available to everyone. Um, and if you have questions throughout, go ahead and put them in the chat box, and I'll be monitoring. Um, before we get started, we've got two quick introductions to make. Um, the first is a guest speaker. His name is Mike Rizzo, and he works with Liza and I at the U.S. Forest Service International Programs. Um, he designs and coordinates outreach, education, and capacity building projects geared toward community level partners. His goal is to build awareness and encourage broader participation in conservation practices, especially as they relate to habitat of migratory species. 
excuse me, while understanding and incorporating priorities of communities into all projects. Charismatic species such as monarch butterflies and birds are used as vehicles to build interest in conservation programs that benefit people and nature alike. Based in Chicago, Mike's worth Mike works with a variety of non-governmental organizations, educational institutions, and government agencies to build networks in the U.S. and at the international level that strengthen individuals, communities, and ultimately conservation through his work. We'll hear a bit more from Mike throughout the presentation, um, but a second introduction that we have is Katie Lynn Bunny. She's the education coordinator at the Monarch Joint Venture. Katie Lynn has a background in environmental education and has been partnering with the U.S. Forest Service since she started as the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the University of Minnesota Monarch Lab. In 2019, she joined the Monarch Joint Venture. In both capacities, she has worked as a key partner in the U.S. Forest Service in planning education and, educa and engagement programs geared toward classroom teachers, informal educators, and community level groups. Thanks for joining us today, Katie Lynn. I think with that, Liza, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Okay, great, thank you. And welcome everyone um, to session two. We are, um, today we're gonna take a look uh, deeper into some of the fun activities that we can do with iTree and the principles of iTree with technology and without technology. And again, welcome to Mike and welcome to uh, Al Zelaya and Jason Henning who are here to also provide um, extra resources and answer any um, questions that uh, we may have. And of course, a big thank you to Dr. Dave who will uh, also present a little bit later. So today we're just going to talk about a quick review of what we did in session one. And my presentation will just take a look at some of the fun projects that don't really require technology. Then we'll hear from Mike about how connection can inspire protection. We'll hear from Dr. Dave, who'll talk more in depth about some iTree projects. Then we'll take a look at your capstone projects and get you thinking about that. And then we'll have a discussion. <clears throat> so just as a recap, you can feel free to unmute yourselves or put it, type it in the chat. Dr. Dave wants to know which iTree tools can be used internationally. Anybody? Eco and Canopy, that's right. Thanks, Akshad. We have eco and canopy. Okay, next question. Is technology required to teach iTree to young people? Yes, no? Anyone in the chat? Okay, well, the answer is not if you're teaching the principle of the tool. Lastly, what other iTree tools would be fun for kids to learn? Anybody remember? My tree, really good, and design, excellent. Thank you. So just as a recap, we want to engage kids in various ways, and there are different approaches and techniques for doing this. We work uh, with them outside their front door, what's in their backyard, expose them early, connect them through emotion. If we remember the picture with Ashim taking a group out for forest bathing, create a sense of wonder, keeping it fun, using live yeah. animals, for example, um, make young people feel like they're part of a greater mission. They can do that through citizen science or through outreach to the community. In, excuse me, include the family and the community in conservation. Train young people to train others. 
and then scaffold the learning. So up next, we're going to take a look at the power of trees, the principles behind iTrees, citizen science opportunities, and we're going to do it without technology. We'll do it through various methods and touch upon several subjects. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with SCHEME, but um, what ways to engage kids through various um, school subjects, so through science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. And I would even add that E can also stand for English literature and composition. And one of the ways that I love incorporating all the STEAM subjects is through expos and creating stations where kids can flow around and try various things. Exos are great for introducing kids at a really young age, engaging them through a variety of different subjects and having them work on things like art or experiments or just talking to some of our resource experts. A little bit different version of an expo is what we're doing in Rwanda. This is a schematic, uh, a basic design of the Rwanda crane cruiser. It's a hitch trailer that we attach to a truck. And because we will be um, working with about 200 children a day of all ages at one school, we can't fit everybody in the truck. So we've decided to create stations outside of the trailer and then the kids can rotate among the stations. So you can see in one of them, a few students can go inside and watch a movie. Others can learn about, um, have trivia contests, learn about different birds. There are also pop-up tables and chairs where they can perform experiments. And no matter whether, no, whether you have a mobile um, station, just like the crane cruiser or have an expo indoors. The idea is that you create stations that um, have a narrative. So for example, here we have, with respect to iTree, we want to show the kids the power of trees, what's outside their front door, that science is fun, that they are scientists and that they be can become stewards. So these are each of the are stations that can happen in, cl in the classroom and outdoors. So I just want to give you some examples of what we've done and what we're thinking of doing um, for these projects with related to iTrees. So the first key thing is to take away that word iTree and replace it with products and services. What does that mean for young people? What can we get from trees? And we started out with that question in the beginning. And for the Rwanda Biobus, what we're doing is a tree lay race. And because we're starting out with 200 students, we're dividing them into groups of three or four. And just within a timed session, they have to come up with as many products and services as possible. And it's something that they can keep. It's low cost. You can use it on, a, you can write it down on a chalkboard. You can use a large piece of paper. You can, you know, work on a notebook. It just depends on the docent. But again, something timed, competitive, gets the ideas flowing, and gets the kids thinking about the ecosystem services and benefits and products from trees. Another thing that um, we've done and that we'd love to recommend is growing a paper tree. Some, it could be in a classroom, it could be in a community center, it could be outdoors if you have uh, weatherproof um, materials. And the idea is that every day, young people will write a benefit or a product on a leaf and then attach it to the tree itself and watch the tree grow and watch the shade and the foliage grow as well. Again, this is for any age, but I know that young people, uh, the younger they are, I think kinder through kindergarten through third grade, fourth grade, they love this exercise. It, again, it is easy to prepare um, and you can use recycled paper. You just have to have a little bit of imagination when you create this. 
One of the things we also want to encourage young kids to do is to go outside into the backyard and meet the green, the green spaces around them. Have them observe, write, or draw what they see. Have them pretend to be a map maker or a bird and take a look at the canopy from the top. What do they see? What do you think they'll be able to see from the top? Have them get up close or be an ant and, and take a look at the understory of urban forests and take a look at the green spaces around them. And then have them jot it all down, have them write it. Qualitative and quantitative measurements of the green space around them. This is easy to prepare, all you need, pens and pencils, clipboard, paper, and measuring tape. And Dr. Dave will talk more about this in his presentation. For the older kids, those who are more comfortable with uh, math and higher math um, can take a, take a look at um, this exercise where we've created three sample trees. And these are just um, trees that we've come up with. So in case you don't have it in, um, if eco isn't ready in a particular place, they can, we can create this table for you. And you can see here what the tree um, benefits are, tree measurements are, and then create a sample plot for them. These are tree X's and Y's and Z on the map. And then have these early or young teens start answering these questions that it will require math, it will require some calculation, and it will require changing the frame of reference for the measurement. So for example, if a tree can retain four liters of water, what does that mean? Is that a bucket of water? Is that a swimming pool full of water? Have them start reframing the actual measurement. And it's a great exercise for also calculating um, and taking a, a, a look at the canopy itself. Making science fun by showing uh, the ecosystem benefits of trees is a great way to engage kids. This is a soil, exper soil erosion experiment that I created for several expos. I had it in my office for a long time. And the tree, uh, the plants on the far left started growing and every day would pour water and we'd see the same result. And then if we bring it to an expo, we have the kids pour the water into the three vials and we have them take a look and answer, why do you think the water on the left side is much clearer than the water on the right? And have them think about soil erosion and the power of trees. In your Google Drive, I'll be putting materials and instructions on how to create this project if you're interested. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me, WhatsApp me anytime. Another fun project is the rainfall simulator. And it's similar to the soil erosion experiment. It's a little bit more complicated to create. But it's a really um, great way to show the difference in surfaces and how these types of surfaces that range from the impervious one all the way to the from the uh, from the far right to one with vegetation on the left how it can retain water and as you can see there are two jars for each type of surface one for the infiltrate or the water being absorbed into the soil and then the runoff those that are not when it rains, those that are escaping the plants and the surfaces and going straight into the rivers and watersheds. Again, it will be on the Google Drive on how to create this. And there are various ways. You don't, it doesn't have to be, uh, this is a pretty medium, complex um, presentation, you can make it as simple as you want using recycled materials or as complicated. Um, I, I've seen some where it, they have a whole system of irrigation and 10 different types of surfaces, including pebbles and rocks, mulch, etc. 
one of my favorite uh, demonstrations with young people is a look at pollution. On the far right, that's my son, Teo, when he was in daycare at four, when he was four, and we created a watershed table and using clay and a variety of other materials. And then kids can pour water over the table and watch it run. So you pour clear water first, and then you pour clear water with a little bit of food coloring and watch how the river, how it creates rivers and where does it all go. It's a little bit of a sloped um, table. So then you can see the flow of pollutants and I've kept the table at that daycare now, and the kids have added and created um, buildings using Legos and sticks, and it's really fun. They've, you know, torn down forests uh, to create parking lots in some cases, and they've seen the flow of the water change. On the far left top corner is sewer in a suitcase. And it was developed by the City uh, University of New York, I believe. And this sewer in the suitcase just basically shows how, during a rainfall, how um, when you pour water in, how water or rain can go through a city and go inside the sewage system. But my favorite um, pollution experiment is actually the bottom left. And that's who polluted the watershed. And I love giving kids these canisters of pollutants. And some of them are, you know, ink or just trash or leaves, um, just different types of material. And then you tell a story. And when they hear their pollutants, one by one, students go up and dump their pollutant inside this um, simulated watershed, the simulated body of water and they start seeing how dirty it becomes. And you put a little toy fish in there or a little diver, and you keep asking the kids, is this something you wanna fish from? Is this something you want to swim in? Is this water you want to drink? And it's a really easy and powerful demonstration of pollution um, via story, via narrative. Again, this will be in Google Drive. We'll have it. Uh, we'll have the different methods just for the hoop, the bottom left, and then the far right. We don't have the sewer in a suitcase um, available, but I'll uh, put a link in there to the sewer in a suitcase just in case you wanted to see what it looked like. A fun experiment that we did with second graders was climate change in a bottle. And in this case, we had um, two, two bottles, two plastic bottles, each with a thermometer and a heat lamp. Or you can put it out under the sun. And then you have the kids record the temperature. And then you start, and then with one of the bottles, it should have um, a plant inside it. And the fun thing that I love uh, to have kids do is make carbon dioxide just using <laughs> vinegar and baking soda. And they blow um, a balloon with the carbon dioxide and they slowly place it using a tube into both um, bottles. And then over time, watch the temperature drop, but it won't drop a lot by a lot it should drop slightly if it's done well and it may not even work at all and that's okay because in science and you want to tell your kids that in science it's not going to be perfect every time so um in this case it just so happened when i did it with the second grader it did work and they were able to understand greenhouse gases after that we had a long discussion and um some of them actually replicated this at home and even to the recommended age here is 10 plus years, I have done it with seven year olds and um, it's just a matter of guiding them through the material, uh, the exercise. Some other fun ideas that we, we've done are eco-efficient demonstrations that don't require electricity. So on the far left there you see um, the eco light. I'm not sure if anybody has heard of it. But essentially the idea is to create a light bulb using water and bleach inside a two liter 
a plastic bottle, hang it from a roof so that half of it is inside the roof and half outside, and let the refraction of light from the sun illuminate a space and what that does for the families is they're able to use that light during the day and not spend a lot of money on electricity. And so they only have to power up at night. And so we replicated this model using a cardboard box and had the kids look through a peephole on one side of the box. And then we turned on the lamp to mimic the sun. And they were able to see how the entire box was flooded with light. So this is a really fun demonstration. Another fun demonstration was the eco cooler that uses the principles of compressed hot air to create colder air. And again, you can use um, a cardboard box and several one liter bottles, uh, plastic bottles and have a blow dryer or just, uh, you can blow through the wider opening, have the children feel how cool the air comes out from the other side. And then on the far right, this is something I did with my kids. We do this every summer. We create eco refrigerators using two clay pots, some sand, and the uh, principle of evapotranspiration. We put a little bit of water in the sand, covered with um, a wet cloth, and any items within the inner clay pot um, over time becomes colder as the sun evaporates the water. And it's a really fun experiment. Um, if you put a thermometer in there, you can see, I think we've been able to get it down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm not really sure. I think that's about uh, five degrees Celsius. You can also engage a lot of young people kids into science through art. I volunteer for the past four, uh, for the past seven years, I've been volunteering at my children's school uh, to teach art. And what we do is every month we feature an artist based on a theme for that month, and then the students replicate or create art in the style of that artist. So one year we did it on um, environment and art, and we focused on some really innovative artists out there like Patrick Doherty, Andy Goldsworthy, and Lorenzo Duran. And um, in each case, we had the students go outside, create tempor temporary art pieces, where we, and then we took a picture of them using what they saw in nature. And when Lorenzo Duran's case, we took broad leaf, um, leaves and had kids create art on them, whether through uh, paper cuttings or paintings, and it's another way of engaging kids with uh, nature. Dr. Dave's gonna talk a little bit about how to become a citizen scientist using i 2 Eco, but this is a great way of engaging kids into um, think about the bigger mission, to be part of a bigger process. And I'll talk, I mean, Dr. Dave will talk a little bit more about this, but one thing we are looking at is how can young people also look at another tool, the rapid as a social assessment tool, for example, and then layer it with the information that you get from iTree. And um, in both this case and the one before, you, the students will need an adult to help them input a lot of the data into the computer or to analyze the information afterwards. But this is something that we are looking at um, and rapid social assessment for those who weren't able to join us during the webinar on social assessment and StuMap. It's just a quick look um, at how space is being used. And you can, uh, the methodology is different for different um, times. So you can take a look at um, just visually. If there's any evidence of human use, you can interview people. Um, and, and there are a bunch of other types of protocols in there, and we can talk about that at the end of this. Be part of a count. You can engage students to do bird counts, bat counts, butterfly counts, or have them just go out and observe using technology. For example, we have this echo meter, and here we are in Chicago, 
and we have this little device that you attach to your smartphone or to your um, tablet, and essentially it picks up um, the free the echolocation noise given off by bats, and you can hear the bats before you can see the bats. And in many cases, the application that goes with the um, echo meter can identify the bat species. And that's a really fun thing for the kids to do. Lastly, we are looking at how to care for the land. Uh, you know, now that the kids are understanding their resources, they can take better care, they can invest more in caring for the resources around them. So here is a low cost um, way that, that um, easy for younger kids to understand, uh, have little pieces of paper on the far left here, have little pieces of paper with different types of trash and they have to sort them according to, comp you know, whether it can be composted, recycled, you can even add upcycle in there, which is creating something else of value from the trash itself. And on the right side, you have a sorting uh, exercise that shows that, ha that uses beans to represent different types of trash and they have the kids have to sort the beans into these larger bins or containers that um, go into a compost pile or recycling pile, et cetera. But then the adults keep adding more beans to it. And it, what it demonstrates is that no matter how um, you try to sort the trash, it's already there, more trash comes. So that rate is much faster than they can sort. So we have them look at that versus if you start sorting from the beginning and you start with nothing or very few tra trash in the landfill, what does that mean when you start adding the trash? You know, you, you get ahead of the curve. Again, easy to prepare and the materials will be on the Google Drive. This is what I was talking about earlier about upcycling, creating um, treasure from trash, wealth from waste, and um, I love these examples. These are fun ones to do with young people, but I want to single out again our um, friends from Swetcha. When we visited them, um, they had a lot of amazing items in their store, in their office, um, and what they were able to do with a lot of the different materials they found um, that would have gone to waste. Other ways you can become a steward. Dr. Dave's gonna talk about tree tags and how to get the community to care about the um, tree resources around them. In Melbourne, Australia, one of the innovative things that um, the city had done was to uh, assign email addresses to different trees. And it actually generated a lot of email for the different trees themselves. And I will share a link with you and you can read some of these emails. They're really amazing. And they really had the population and the citizens invested into in the care of these trees. And they were really, some of them were really heartwarming. And lastly, you could adopt a tree. Here we are in Rwanda, or there's this program with the Rwanda Wildlife Conservation Association that fosters competition and stewardship among the kids. And essentially, um, the children can adopt a tree or plant a tree, and they are going to compete to see who can um, raise or grow a healthy tree. And they really take it very seriously. In fact, some of them have adopted many, many trees, and they do win small prizes, but in the end, they end up falling in love with stewardship um, that they don't even want the prize themselves. So those were sort of some of the fun projects that I've been involved in and, and thinking of doing with others in the future. And I hope that really sows the seeds for your projects, um, you know, and we hope to hear from many of you about um, what you plan on doing with these, uh, with what you have and with your uh, students themselves. And with that, I wanna thank you and um, I'm open to questions. And um, let me know in the chat.
Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Liza, for a great presentation. Thank Folks you. Folks can ask questions in the chat box if they have any or unmute yourself. Okay, well, I just hope, well, Allison, maybe um, people can um, just ask the questions in the chat box and then we can keep this going. And if people have um, questions, we can save them for the end. That sounds great. Um, thanks, Ooh. Liza. Um, oh. Are all the materials made up of eco-friendly products? They can be made up of eco-friendly products. In many of the cases, like the soil erosion experiment, Arv, um, we used, uh, I used recycled bottles. So I got fished them out of the recycling bins, um, the plank that held them together was a piece of wood that had been thrown away and I just went ahead and created that experiment. I, the tape is not eco-friendly but it had to be put on there um, but I'm pretty sure many of them can be made with eco-friendly products. Thank you for your question. Great, so I'm going to make, Mike, I'm gonna make you a presenter. I'm ready. Okay. Share and let me. Okay, good morning to my colleagues in the US and, and good evening to all of my colleagues in India. I, I haven't met everybody, but I have met Akshat and uh, you know, warm greetings from Chicago. Um, just to confirm, Allison, Liza, you could hear me well and see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. All right, I'm going to start the presentation now. And uh, so what, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to step back from, from some of the details, talk about uh, a larger, kind of the bigger picture of it, you know, engaging people where they live. And uh, it's going to complement uh, the work from Dr. Dave, from Allison, from Liza and uh, really hopefully tie it together. But really, is, you know, it's, uh, why, why are we doing this? You know, we're, how do we engage people? And uh, there's a lot of techniques to it, uh, you know, outreach programs, training, you know, creative ideas. And I look at it, it, it boils down to, or it comes down to two, just different tools. All of these, like whether it's eye tree, whether it's a bird, a monarch, soil, the erosion experiment, they're all tools to just to attract people in, and, and get them involved. But to me, the, the key to, to engaging with people first is stepping back and listening. What does a community actually want? And uh, so I'm gonna talk about that, you know, the overview, I'm gonna give a little, uh, talk a little bit about how some of the successes we've had over the years. Uh, I'm gonna give context, why is the Forest Service working in Chicago? What am I doing here? Um, and then some, some case studies, some examples, some techniques we use. You know, focus on uh, education. Um, also, you know, conservation in the home. That's something I'm very interested in. I was chatting with Allison and Eliza yesterday, and um, I always say my family is my focus group. If I can convince my family that conservation is important, I can convince anybody. And I think if, if you ever have a meal with your extended family, or everybody around the table, trying to get a consensus on any topic is difficult enough. And uh, so that's something I talk about. And that's really building excitement. I'll close out on that. Um, Liza really does a great job of explaining that. How do you use art and integrate art and culture? You have to build excitement. And so I'll be using the monarch butterfly uh, uh, as, as an example there. So moving forward, the context. So, you know, I work for the Forest Service, uh, specifically in the International Programs Office. and Everything I do in the United States domestically, so I, I have a lot of projects on the ground in the US, everything has an international connection. And, um, and how do I do that? It's, it's, it's a lot of it's, it's dealing with habitat outreach programs associated with uh, migratory species, uh, migratory birds, monarch butterflies, dragonflies, bats. Uh, you saw that equimeter from that Liza put in. Um, that really establishes, so th that's one of the tools I use um, one, it's very engaging, it's very exciting for folks, 
but it's also, it ties into our agency's mission. So besides uh, forestry or hydrology, migratory species conservation is a huge part of our program. Um, and this is, the program is called Wings Across the Americas. So work I do in Chicago or elsewhere, Cleveland, DC, ties into work that's happening in say Mexico and down south in the Latin America. And from that, I, I, I learned from all of the, a lot of the communities that we work with. So we're investing in conservation, uh, uh, important uh, areas for conservation along these flyaways, but also in people. And we all learn from one another. And that, that key is listening. So it's about habitat. I mentioned it. Conservation, hotspots, uh, important bird areas, habitat for monarchs. These are, these are strategic investments. It's habitat. Um, by, by these important spots on the flyway, they, you know, it's, it really protects investments along the entire flyway. So I mentioned the migratory species. It's about habitat. You see there, you know, uh, flowers, nectar sources, but it's also about people. And that's what it boils down to. How do we get people involved? Not everybody's gonna go out to a national forest. Not everybody is gonna appreciate it as much, but the folks walking here in this picture, for example, there's, these are families walking we work with. I just like this picture because it, to me, it, it, it tells a story. I want them to be advocates. In this case, it's for monarch butterfly conservation, but they may not go to a national forest out West in the Western US, but these are advocates. They could be voters, um, influence policy, um, or just, you know, it, or they can go, let's get them out there. But anyway, so that, it's about people in the, you know, and it's also appreciating where you're at here. You know, we could tie in food security, we could tie in conservation in education, that sort of thing. So it's about people. And going back to the forest service, here we have a, a tall grass prairie habitat, natural and protected area. Uh, I actually used to work there before I started in the international office. So what does this mean to those people back here? Why should they care? And so, this to me is a is a key question why should someone who lives in an urban area here's an industrial zone in the south bronx uh the gr green spaces in that neighborhood are those plants growing in the cracks and i know akshat's visited there last year uh, but why should they care and so that that's a big challenge how do you foster a strong connection for nature for conservation uh with urban families this is a, an extreme example um you know, it's a steel mill in Northwest Indiana. I know Al, uh, Al knows this area well. Lives and Allison have visited there, Akshat as well. Uh, it's an extreme example, but there are people who live next door to this. They're in the zone of impact. And so how do, how do you foster this connection? If this is what you're seeing every day? Well, I, I would argue you can. And the first step really is, is fostering, but before you get to eye tree and planting and appreciation for protected areas, a positive experience with nature. That's the key. That's the key first step. A positive experience with nature. So, you know, when you go in, and then you think about it, what's in urban areas? You could use these in outdoor labs. Here's a, a partnership with the, the Peggy Note of our Nature Museum. And again, this picture tells a story. It's an urban area. It's actually a, a forest preserve um, just outside of the city of Chicago. We use it uh, for teaching. It's, it's a program called River Explorers. But if you can't get to the protected areas, even here at this river, Use, use what you have as your outdoor lab, as your outdoor classroom. And uh, partnerships are key to this. You know, the Forest Service can't do it alone. Here at the Nature Museum, I'm going to be mentioning partners throughout this uh, presentation. So, you know, going back, I, I talk about families, my family, my focus group. That's my daughter uh, on the left uh, at one years old. And intuitively, she um, uh, picked up the plant and, 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 and got involved with me. And uh, I, I usually ask, children when I present to the, the third grade, the fourth grade, whatever classroom, you know, how many of you are scientists? And usually want to be silly and raise their hand and everybody starts giggling. And I say, everybody raises their hand. And they, I said, you are all born scientists. And I was like, what? I said, what does a, a baby do? An infant, it's crawling, touching, tasting, getting into everything, exploring its world, his or her world. It's uh, the baby is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's observation, it's learning by experience, experimentation, getting hurt. Well, we stifle it. What do we do? Sit still, you're gonna get dirty. Stop, you're making noise. So I look at this, it starts young, it begins at home, you make this connection, and then that connection leads to protection. It leads to conservation, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice phrase, connection means protection. Um, you know, the sign, you know, don't pick this, but that's what it means, foster this, uh, you know, this positive experience in nature, started at home and then you know when i look at it I'm, I'm we're very focused on the household 
international programs, yes, we are working in conservation hotspots, but also very focused where you live in an urban area. So if, if, if I can get folks to appreciate what they have in their front yard, their backyard, their patio, and then it goes to the city block, and then it goes to the square block, to the community, then not, not only have folks appreciating what they have, observing and identifying what's in their community, and that's key. And then everything falls into place later. Your, your protected areas, your parks, your green spaces, you're building that advocacy and awareness. So working at the community, you know, stepping back into the community level now, what, how do we promote this? You know, do I, just, uh, do I just show up and say, hey, we're gonna plant trees, we're gonna plant nectar sources, uh, do experiments? Well, that's where we go back to that first, uh, the tool, our ears listening what do communities want what are the priorities well em employment especially these days employment is a huge priority uh we can't do it all uh yes we do have employment programs public health and mental health physical health is a key recreation but one of the keys is education that's what i'm going to focus on in this presentation i know uh the other presenters will be talking about public health and, and recreation so i'm going to focus on this education that is a key priority any economic level i would argue that you know, talking to parents, the, they, they're looking for, for, for educational programs in their communities, not just in school, but also in the neighborhood. So that's one key thing. And so that's what I'm going to focus on now. That's what the Forest Service and our partners have focused on. So we developed this course. I mentioned the Forest Service, we can't be everywhere, we can't do anything. So how do we expand our impact? Well, part with our partners, um, we developed these university level courses in environmental education and conservation. Uh, and then there's a variety of other courses with museums and other and other folks who do workshops. But with these courses, um, we're very focused on training teachers and informal educators. It's a sort of teacher to teacher model. Uh, I, I was talking to Dave. I said, yeah, it, I'm an educator. I'm an informal educator. Uh, but uh, for an actual classroom teacher who understand, understands like uh, the standards, what, what's appropriate for a fifth grade? What, what's for high school? How does it tie into the standards established by the state? And for that, I, I, I really rely on partners. So we, we invited Katie Lynn Bunny. She's on the, uh, uh, online. She'll be able to answer questions later. Uh, but we use inquiry-based approaches. Um, how do you use your assets in the community as outdoor classrooms? So that's a big thing. And these are very intensive courses, uh, you know, multiple day. Typically, they're three-day courses. We have them. What's interesting about these courses, they're led by academics, leading academic researchers, say, in monarch butterfly conservation or in citizen science. Um, these are folks who are publishing, we get up-to-date information, but we do breakout sessions. So say we have a cohort of 40 folks, then we'll break them out into in, uh, four smaller groups. Well, those small groups are actually led by expert classroom teachers. How do you integrate this stuff? So I could be an academic, I could be a forest service employee, but do I know how to integrate this in the seventh grade? No, we ask a seventh grade teacher. And he or she will teach that class. Hey, this works for me, this doesn't work, and that sort of thing. So to date, we've had, the number's probably even out of date, but over 600, probably closer to 700 at this point um, uh, in, in these courses. So the first one, we call it the North American Monarch Institute. Kind of fancy name, I know, but um, it's focused on monarch butterfly conservation. That is one of these tools. Why monarchs? It's accessible. Uh, monarchs arrive in the upper Midwest, uh, roughly beginning of May. And we see them all the way through September. You can find eggs, caterpillar, habitat. Well, it lends itself well to teaching. So we've integrated some, uh, there's a, the Monarchs in the Classroom program. Katie Lynn coordinates education with the joint Monarch Joint Venture. So this has been very successful. Folks have responded well. But, uh, and I've had folks, butterflies, what about that? But look, and, and the, this picture, again, tells a story. You can see there's, you know, the, there's uh, biology, ecology, conservation, but also how to use this as a schoolyard activity. And the participants actually get university level credit for this. And so the, the, the Monarch Institute, it's, it's also basics. How do you, what, what can you do outside to, to, to sort of tie the outdoors uh, with, with the indoor classroom? And so from that, because of successes, we started uh, a second course called Advanced Schoolyard Ecology Explorations, AC. And there we said, you know, there was a lot of interest in citizen science. Um, here they're on the agricultural campus, my colleagues here at the University of Minnesota, that's where we, we uh, in the past, we've done some of the classrooms, we, we do rotate where we do them, but citizen science, they're, <clears throat> they are assessing uh, milkweed for monarch eggs and caterpillars. 
excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. So citizen science, that's a focus, but it isn't just about monarchs. Yeah, we have monarchs here, we're capturing them, but nature photography, it's a big one. Tying in those arts, what's gonna, get, what's gonna attract people? What's the draw? Uh, dragonfly is a big one. Other one, that's another one that builds excitement. People, not everybody knows much about dragonfly, so it's lent itself well. Uh, phenology, uh, phenology, uh, you know, really this tracking of, uh, using phenology, like for example, you could use this to look at climate change. You can tie it into migratory species, and um, the Great Sunflower Project is one. There's a, there's a there's a there's a variety of very accessible citizen science projects. But data collection, iNaturalist. Here's one I love, iNaturalist. Um, anybody can do it. You collect data. I mean, there's a variety of them, and I, I know uh, with iTree and with some of the other programs you could use in, in Delhi. But is data collection enough? I never encourage our partners, our teachers, students to collect data for data collection sake. You use data, you share it, and then in turn, that drives management decisions. And for land management agencies such as the Forest Service or managing species like Fish and Wildlife Service. And what's critical is not only are your partners sharing data with um, the, these various platforms that in turn uh, influence uh, the decisions, but you have to report back. How was this data used? The Monarch Joint Venture is great at that. We use the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, and they send a report out. This is what this is what citizen scientists found. This is what we use that information for. So it's 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 key. And then trees. You know, I'm, I got to tie it back in the trees for for the for the presentation. Science in the schoolyard, uh, planting trees, uh, where space allows planting trees. But in turn, you could use iTree. And and Dr. Day is going to talk a lot more about this. But so you plant a tree. So what? Uh, but you could assess it. What are the benefits? And so the, the children can figure out benefits, but they can report back to their their teachers, their administrators, or school director, to their families. Hey, this this provides these ecosystem services. This uh, collects stormwater. There's a lot of things, and uh, so that's important. And then the third course that we we focus on. Uh, this is the newest one uh, we piloted last year. Migratory and Urban Bird Institute. We got a lot of demand also for birds. Another. Uh, uh, wildlife that's ubiquitous in uh, rural areas, uh, um, urban areas. On the on the left there, it's at the University of Minnesota Agricultural Campus where we do a lot of training. But to the right, you know, we we compare and contrast rural areas with suburban with urban. And then again, it's all inquiry based, knowing what's there in your community. And I did that's that's what's key. We that's the bottom line. Whether you're using birds, I don't care if you're using snakes. We want people to know what's out there and be able to talk about it and, uh, and, and really encourage them to talk about it with each other. So uh, the so what's of it. So we're training teachers. What does it mean? Well, the Forest Service, the joint venture, these universities, they can't be everywhere. But teachers really multiply our efforts. Their presence in the community, their training teachers, on the, uh, their training children on the left, well, ideally, we're having them train their other their, their their staff members too, but training children and then training parents. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. That to me is key. It really, if if you look at the kind of if you make it into a flow chart that goes in a, a circle, you have teachers, children, parents reinforcing it at home. And so uh, I'm getting to the modern butterfly example now. Uh, this is one of the tools we used and. Um, it's guided, I think I've been involved in Monarchs now 15 years or more, and never, if you told me 20 years ago I'd be working and this passionate about butterflies, I would never have believed you, but uh, it is, and I'm, I'm very proud of the work uh, that uh, our partners are doing. But so Monarchs, um, it's a great tool. Uh, I would argue, for me anyway, it's been the best tool for teaching science, uh, getting folks involved. There's caterpillars, uh, it, the plant uh, grows, it's accessible, it's low cost. That's what's key. At the community level, is it low cost? Key for teachers, key for families. You know, there's a Starbucks cup. Uh, I use that to show you. it can be done with anything. Uh, not necessarily an eco-friendly material, but it's recycled. It's used uh, as a as a material that folks can use. And then this plant. I keep talking about monarch. The host plant is called milkweed. And I know there's some milkweed in in India because I was looking that up. But that plant grows in a crack in the sidewalk. I, I could tell you where I can I could tell you the two corners, the streets where these are at. Well, my argument for you is that these plants, this this crack in the sidewalk with these plants is an outdoor classroom for a child. So even a child that doesn't have a backyard, here we have milkweed growing out of the sidewalk. They can find eggs, caterpillars, and use that to nourish that butterfly to an adult butterfly and release it. But you can also plant it. 
here in the schoolyard here this is in cicero illinois and so, so that that's a schoolyard actually in an industrial area and then to the right if you remember that 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 photo i showed you earlier of the freight train tracks you know it's the little green growing up in the gravel well this is a rain uh garden uh it's a, with a partner called rocking the boat in uh the south of bronx this neighborhood is one of the poorest in the u.s but also has one of the probably the largest lack of green space too in, in, in New York City area. Yeah, there's some trees, street trees here and there are some parks, but for the most part, it's it's buildings, industrial and residential apartments. Well, they, they created a rain garden uh, that supports monarch butterflies and that is an outdoor classroom for their youth. So you plant it, butterflies will find it. And that's, what's, that's why this has been a great tool in urban areas. It's not the only tool, but it's worked out well. So tying this to Delhi, um, you could, uh, in the interest of time, uh, we could talk about it afterwards, but some of the things I was thinking about yesterday after kind of rehearsing with Liza and Dr. Dave and Allison, you know, thinking about everybody, what, what was, our, what is everybody's first gateway in the nature? What excited you if, if you didn't have green spaces? I was fortunate there was a park, uh, there's trees in, in the, in the, but I played in the alley and I played by freight train tracks. Why freight train tracks? There were snakes there. When it rained, we would find snakes. And that was our wilderness as children grew up in the middle of the city. Uh, and then in Delhi, you know, are there charismatic species? Is it an insect? Is it a tree, uh, a, a flower, a plant that can be used? Is there host plants or insects that you could use to get teachers involved? And then I'm gonna I'm gonna round out the talk talking about some of the art and cultural symbolism symbolism we use to get people involved. And then I'll I will uh, answer any questions and then pass it over to Dr. Dave. So the case study I'm gonna use uh, there's a there's an organization. Uh, it's called El Valor, it means uh, the bravery, uh, valor, bravery. And it's, it's an organization that works with adults and children with special needs, but also families, thousands of families throughout the city of Chicago. Uh, the majority of the families are from Latin America, especially Mexico. Uh, what's interesting and why I picked this case study uh, to, to present with Delhi also, um, there's a lot of uh, rural to urban migration patterns. And, and I think that's common of any city around the world. What's interesting in this case, the rural to urban, we have folks coming from the international level. So rural areas of Mexico, some urban areas, some cities, but for the bulk of it, coming from rural areas and urban settings. So we have parents, grandparents who worked on farms, ranches, um, and had a connection to the land, but their children are losing it. They're in the city. So this is a, it's, it's a nice uh, comparison. Um, and then we use some symbolism. Uh, we, we train their staff through these programs and other ones. And then in turn, that staff, um, they train up all of their staff, all of the parents and members of the community. They make us, uh, I always say, they make me look great. Uh, so showing a map here, this is the monarch butterfly migration. We call them flyaways, but a migratory route. Uh, that blue star in the bottom, central Mexico. If I show this map to our partners, uh, to the families, I'll start nodding and smiling because they follow the same migration pattern. Uh, this is for butterflies, but people follow that same pattern. I, my, my, my dad's side of the family is from Mexico, right where that blue star is, a little bit to the west of there. We followed that same pattern, my family members. As a child, I went back and forth uh, from Chicago to central Mexico, three-day bus ride, following the same pattern, crossing over to butterflies. So we, people really relate their story to this, their migration story, their family story to this. And so when actually Val's on the line, uh, I've met Val some 14, 15 years ago or so when we were exploring cities for monarch conservation. And I said, aside from all the curriculum and lesson plans, this is what we should do. And so we did, we tied in this cultural symbolism. This is a, a mural from central Mexico, 1500 years old, um, for where many of our families come from. And, and there, uh, you can see there, there's two branches there and that's a swallowtail butterfly they're capturing. The little streams coming in their mouth means they're talking. And so we, we tied in, there's, there's just this sort of, it's this, this connections of nature and the land that go back to ancient times and then here in the modern times, um, I debated whether to put it in, but uh, my colleagues said believe it. Um, the monarch is on all the symbols and food and signs and taxis and a license plate. That's my cousin's license plate. And so we really just really use this energy. This uh, it's identifying this cultural symbol as a monarch to get people involved. And people get excited. So we train parents. We design. We call it parent PD, parent professional development. We use the same materials, same lessons. Uh, for parents. We just don't do a three-day course. We try to do it, uh, uh, you know, after, during school hours or after school, but we, 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 we teach them the same thing. Monarch biology, ecology, how can you do this at home? 
parents are the first teachers. As I mentioned, children are born scientists. Well, parents are the first teachers. They're setting examples for their kids, uh, for their children. How do we help them hone their skills? And how do we learn from them? And so we, we've done, this builds leadership. And then you can see here, here's a mom, probably 30 chrysalis that she, she, she mounts it to a stick. She has a live butterfly in a container. So each year, these families um, that, that work with us on this partnership, there's other partnerships as well. Uh, at Envalor, 500 monarch caterpillars are raised in butterflies and released each year through the summer. My phone at, during monarch season is always, people are sending me photos. I found some in the excitement. I found this with my child. And so that's another key thing. We're building leadership of children. It could be trees, it could be butterflies, it could be flowers, it could be turtles. And here you see this, I love this quote. I'm an expert, I help my teacher now. And so this child actually was started during preschool and now she's in the fifth grade, I actually soon to be in the sixth grade. And she helps her teacher, she's excited and she's an ambassador for monarchs. So this art and culture, we get people involved, whether it's costumes, painting, drawing, photography, uh, this is a critical thing because uh, it's, it's, you know, it, it could be journaling, you know, it, it, it could be a journal, but art and nature, art and culture, it's really important. And uh, anything that gets folks involved. And then really tying it back, uh, I mentioned a positive experience in nature. That is my initial goal. It unites communities, it unites families, um, it, gets, it, it builds excitement. And here in these cases, the, the costumes are, are parades for Day of the Child uh, at the end of April but it really gets people, it's a conversation starter. And folks, what are you doing? Well, we're, we're celebrating the arrival of monarchs, we're planting the, so this positive experience as unite communities. But, you know, kind of closing out, all of this is more than monarch butterflies. Um, it could be, you know, we have the tools uh, that we're gonna talk about, but it's really strengthening people. You know, leadership, we're, we're promoting communications. I, I have moms, they'll tell me, I never thought I would uh, talk in front of a group, but here I am talking about monarchs. What, and, and knowing this, this the, the knowledge that the community has is very fascinating to me because I will go, I'll see a mom and she'll say, well, I don't know anything about birds. Oh, well, that's a male and female. Uh, this is the female there, but I don't know anything about birds. Oh, I remember that bird. It would fly through my community in Mexico in March, and then we wouldn't see it until October, but I don't know much. Oh, and then I know this. It loves this plant. And it's funny as you start drawing it out and they know more than they let on. But really want to get people thinking strategically. How can I promote education? Uh, with my child, employment opportunities, jobs in the forest service, career paths, um, and then it really social networks. I can't even count how many people are involved anymore because it seems like everybody starts their own network and, you know, giving folks a voice. So in turn, we're strengthening people, individuals, families, but that strengthens communities. And that's important. Here's uh, the, the adults program, adults with special needs who get involved in monarch conservation. We're actually doing virtual bird workshops with the same group right now. Uh, with Audubon Great Lakes. Strengthening communities, what does that do? Well, that strengthens conservation. This is the opposite end of the flyway at Grassland in Mexico. It strengthens communities up here, can strengthen conservation all along the flyway, which in turn, again, strengthens communities and then leads back to strengthening conservation. You see how it, it plays? And that's, that's what I'm uh, interested in. That's the big picture. Strong communities, strong conservation programs. These are just some of many partners I want to thank. Um, Katie Lynn's available also to um, uh, answer questions, but uh, with that, I could I could turn it over to Liza or answer any questions. And uh, I appreciate everybody's time and uh, uh, patience in following my presentation. Thanks, Mike, for a great presentation. Um, we'll open it up for questions if we have some, and then we'll move on to Dr. Dave with more time for questions after his presentation. Thanks. Mike, this is Dave. Um, I I was excited to see this. This is the second time that I saw you do the presentation, and the work and the um, scope of what you do with so many um, you know community members and that connection, the social connection, and and you know I, I love like I told you before the the license plate and all that connection of the monarch. Uh, just tremendous work and very exciting to see. And, um, you know, I, I just, uh, I wouldn't mind watching it again. <laughs> well, thanks. And for, for our colleagues in Delhi, uh, I'm very excited to learn from all of you and the ideas that you will have in your communities 
how to get folks involved because I don't have all the answers. I have some tools I use, but I'm always learning from everybody, whether it's a university, whether it's El Valor here, whether it's, you know, Akshat's work, Liza, Allison, I look forward to learning from everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Oh, Allison, I was just pitching one other thing. You know, um, one cool thing which is interesting, and you're you're trying to find a topic in Delhi that folks might be interested in, in choosing or selecting or as a common denominator, and 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 sometimes it can be you know something like the monarch, but it can also be something that's happened, whether it be a disturbance or a natural disaster or you know, insect or disease or pests that come into an area. And I'm just thinking of the galvanization um, in, where I live uh, after a tornado came through and wiped out about um, 30,000 trees within the community. Um, they were able to create a nonprofit group, which has really materialized, mobilized, and really turned into a, a network of networks, like you mentioned. So that was great, great to. Um, you know, it doesn't always have to be a, a, a monarch, but it, it can be any event or anything as you look at what you might look at in, in Delhi. Uh, Allison, should I just start? Are there any questions in the queue? Did anyone see anything or things in the chat? Yeah, so we don't have any questions right now. I think we'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Dave, and we'll. Um... We'll have more time for questions after your presentation. Okay, great. Um, thanks for joining us today. And um, you know, I'm excited to follow two really good pre presentations and a lot of great ideas um, on the involvement of these folks, the youth, in, in, in really becoming the future scientists and, and really um, expressing their, their passion for experimentation, exploration, and discovery. And, you know, we look at how these folks can become the scientists of the future and how we can encourage them to really um, explore and, and really uh, become part of nature. The thing is, they already are scientists and they're just young scientists, as, as, as I mentioned earlier. So um, I just think that's uh, an important component to um, keep in mind as we go through the presentation. Um, I, this, I'm, I had this slide up the other day or last week, but I always look at the big picture. I'm gonna show you a few things, and as we zoom into the iTree components, but always be looking at that big picture. And as I mentioned, we have a program here uh, called Off to the Great Outdoors that we've uh, used as a pilot in, um, in our schools and our after school programs, summer enrichment programs, things like that. But we look at the big picture, then I zero down or we zero down into the uh, urban forest ecosystem. And some of the things that you just saw that Liza had, you know, that water table or the, uh, the, uh, the rainfall, the water table, the watershed table, the soil, the plants, vegetation, all of that is um, the tools that you can use to start to zero in as you zero down to the individual tree level or the urban tree canopy, which generally iTree will look at. And we can look at when we get down to that level, I'll show you a few things here, but starting at that big picture and working your way all the way down, tree benefits, species identification, how we measure and we um, can determine the size, age, things like that, mapping it, uh, getting notes, field data, archiving, things like that, and how to really create science uh, discovery and how the folks can get accustomed to collecting information, archiving the information. And then one of the things we often don't want to talk about is reporting out. And I'll show you a couple examples of that. But how can you uh, communicate with the public and, and your um, colleagues and, and other folks what you've observed, seen, or um, uh, recommended for a particular landscape, a community, your schoolyard, your backyard, a public park or public place. So one of the simple, I just want to show you some little things here when I'm looking at that big picture. So I'm trying to talk to the folks about the earth and the sun and the solar system and all of that. And, 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 and folks say, why do you teach them that? 
Well, I want to make sure that they have, and they've learned it, most of the kids that we're dealing with in sixth grade or fifth grade, um, they've already learned all of that. But I'm just trying to reiterate with them and, and, and the idea of um, how the planets work, the, the solar system and all of that. And one of the easiest ways is just to create a simple sundial. So what do you do? You take a paper plate, you put a pencil in there, you set up the uh, clock, and you're able to uh, just have the kids go out and make one of these, and then setting it out in the out there with placing, um, uh, you know, using your watch to calibrate it, or using North to calibrate it, and then um, they can just uh, come out a couple hours later and see that the time has changed. And so here's this actually me with a bunch of little kids. Uh, they wanted to put fancy faces on their clocks, so you're getting that art side involved. And these kids, these are uh, fourth and fifth graders, um, and you see they, they, they're creating. Their, um, you see there's pictures of the kids on the right. They're putting leaves and, and other things. So we're trying to make that connection from the big picture all the way down to the individual tree level. Um, and you can see even old people like me can have a little fun doing it. And so another one that we look at, and, and Liza showed the uh, watershed table and, and the filtration things, but one of the ideas that we look at as you start looking at, you know, rainfall, climate, climate change, but then weather, so you zero in from the big picture of climate change all the way down to uh, the local uh, weather situation and microclimates and things like that, and how trees, and we get into this where we start discussing what happens if you put your rain gauge underneath the tree or out in the open, how the rainfall interception um, uh, by a tree is really important as far as reducing runoff and things like that. And we can actually calculate that out within the iTree uh, uh, canopy program will give us that for an area of interest. So we have the kids make their own little rain gauge here and these are just water bottles that you take and you just cut off the top. You flip it upside down and you see it on the right here. You'll see it and then you tape it in place and you put down the uh, either centimeters or, centimeters or inches. And then we'll um, put it outside and, and we'll demonstrate a little bit with the kids. But the idea is this kid's a, a third grader and his this is his in front. So... It's for all ages, but now he may have a little idea, oh, um, that rainfall can be measured. I uh, experience it because I have to put my raincoat on. But then how much is it raining and how this whole science discovery uh, um, can impact him? So I just like that because that's a, a, a one of our younger audiences during a, um, a summer enrichment program. And he was able to keep up with uh, most of the sixth graders that his brother was in the class. He just happened to tag along. So that was great. Um, and then here's another one where we're looking again at weather and how, you know, trees can act as buffers. We can cool the atmosphere, which changes the wind patterns, reduces wind, increases wind depending on uh, how the earth heats up and all of those components. So we, we get into a little bit of discussion of that. But here's a, a making a weather vane. So we try to uh, get the kids engaged in some active um, building, construction, or creating of some tools that will help them to better understand. And in this case, we're going to better understand wind and wind streams. And so the idea is you take the uh, uh, cup, and then what you can do is you put it on a paper plate, or you can have it on, on, as on the kids on the right, which is still the... Uh, these are actually from the 7-Eleven. They're coffee cups that were, you know, I go to, every time we do this, I stop at a 7-Eleven and ask, can I borrow 20 cups? They give us the 20 cups with the uh, covers. We add uh, some gravel in here to give it some weight. And the kids go ahead and they, they create these themselves. They cut out the uh, arrows and the uh, wind banner. And then we have straws, again, from 7-Eleven. Stick them in a pencil with a little push pin. And here the kids are goofing around looking at the wind change direction in front of the fan. So it's nothing, you know, this is really inexpensive to do. Um, in case, you know, and we basically do this uh, at little to no cost. So that's one of the key components of this. It's, it's uh, exciting for the kids. You can see the smiles on their face and the, the, the discovery and inquiry that they're uh, exhibiting right there. So 
I just think that really shows that you know a successful day with the kids. And so as we start looking, you know, beyond just weather and temperature and things like that, because we have a whole series, and I'm actually on the Google Drive, you'll see I'm um, putting a document. It just says uh, Dave B. Uh, session number two. I have a couple documents in there now, and I'll be adding some more. So I show you a, a few of these and how to actually make some of these, plus a bunch of other uh, low-cost, no-cost uh, exploration tools. So one of the things is we make with the kids is um, we measure the uh, size of a tree, try to calculate the age of a tree by looking at the diameter at breast height. So we talk to them a little bit about how we measure trees. That standard measure of four and a half feet from the uh, ground up. So some of them are uh, reaching up high because the kids are just about four and a half feet tall. And so we'll have them create a uh, DVH tape and then the other thing we'll look at is the height of the tree. And you can see here on the right, we're making a clinometer, and I'll show you that in a minute. But the thing is, um, we were demonstrating these kids. Um, this was a uh, an enrichment class that we did that we were demonstrating some of the uh, no-cost tools that we made. And I'll show you that it's actually trying to put these together. So here's the, on the right side, you'll see we just take a, um, a tape, a 100 foot tape, and we stretch it out. We make these about a 36 to 48 inch long a piece of um, survey tape. So you can buy these, a roll of this for about $3, and you just put it alongside the uh, tape measure. And then the kids go with a Sharpie marker and they mark every inch along the, um, uh, on the, on the uh, flagging tape. And then on the left, you'll see them actually outside using the DVH tape right here. And so they're looking and you'll see it's completed with the inches. And then what that'll do is give us a circumference of the tree. And then we, uh, when we come back into our classroom, we'll work with them on converting circumference to diameter. Okay, because it's easy, you know, it's, it's tough to make a diameter tape because you have to have a diameter tape to replicate it. But with making just a simple um, tape measure with the inch by inch by inch, it's really simple. And you'll see on the left here, the uh, I just put the 100-foot tape in there to sort of mimic um, what the uh, students would use there uh, as they've made it. And so here they are putting it together, and um, you see a couple of kids, and they go ahead and just do their magic. Oops. And then here we go to making a clinometer or a measure of tree height. And I'll point out a few things in a minute, but this is the one that I've found is the easiest, quickest, cheapest, and really provides some, uh, a little bit of trigonometry instruction that most of the kids aren't up for that at, at the age of, I mean, fifth or sixth grade, but the high school students certainly um, take this and, 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 and they practically uh, have it all figured out. They can build one of these in a few minutes and they're out there measuring tree by tree by tree. And I don't even have to provide that instruction because they're familiar with how to calculate the height. I'll show you that in a second. But the little or the younger kids um, in the younger grades here, little, the littler they are, the more help they need with this one. But what they're gonna do is um, go back to a 45 degree angle and they're going to look at the tree um, at, um, and then we're going to measure the distance from the, their feet over to the tree and get the height of the tree. One of the things I just want to point out in this picture, you can see the uh, student here with the clipboard. He's collecting the information. So even at this young age, if we're having the kids go out, they're getting the tree height. And what we do is uh, you know, we make contests out of this one here to have them find the nearest um, uh, tree height in the in the park where we're uh, working, and so we send them out for about uh, 30 minutes, and um, have them work on their own with a uh, one of our interns, and they'll work and um, really highlight uh, some great learning out there, but also uh, expand their knowledge and understanding not only of the uh, tool but of the trigonometry, and then they could win the prize at the end for having the highest tree. Um, and then we'll go double check to make sure they didn't um, goof up on that tree height. 
And what we're going, uh, and here's just some of the uh, sheets that are included in your, your package here, but there's just the phenometer, the pore factor phenometer here. And then it gives you the instruction of how to calculate out that information and how to just uh, fill out your uh, data sheet. And then on the right here, just another explanation of it. So uh, I just want to make sure you know about that. And then this is one that Liza, um, uh, one of the ones that she uses with the kids flipping upside down here on the left. And they look between their legs and they get the 45 degree angle. And then they see how far they are away from the tree. So they don't even have to make a phenometer. But understand that tree height is a, a indication of the benefits that trees provide. The bigger a tree, the more mature a tree, um, the bigger the DBH, that means a tree is a little more mature than maybe some of them around them. And so we're able then to start to sort of impress the height is important to help calculate not only the, uh, the height or the size of the tree, but the benefits it provides and a little bit about the uh, estimation of the age of the tree. So we'll work with them to have an understanding that a uh, 40-foot oak tree, um, and we have a set of the uh, sort of standards, um, and it can estimate the uh, age of that tree. So we use some forestry techniques that we can bring into the picture. And then some other ones, you see this is just a simple one of a, a person, and we have them pretend that they're standing on each other's shoulders, and how many of them do they need to get to the height of the tree? So you multiply the number of kids times their height. The other one is using a, a known object, and in this case here, a pencil. And then um, you can also, Liza, use a thumb, so you can use whatever is available, and, and we've used something uh, have the kids do it with a twig. So they just have to, um, you know, be able to sort of draw that um, a little bit of inference to, oh, it's one pencil high, the pencil is four inches tall, and then I can calculate it out. So that works out pretty well. Um, another one here, okay, so if you've gone beyond, now we have the measure of the tree. And keep in mind when you need to do a calculation for and when we get into iTree Eco, um, and we can talk a little bit about that later, but all you need to have is the species, the size, um, and the condition. So if you have those three pieces of information, then you can run an iTree Eco analysis. Okay, so that is the three pieces of information that you need to calculate tree benefits. So I just showed you um, the size here. So we calculate that. The condition is something that you can look at. Uh, we give the kids, you know, good care for and dead. And I think um, Liza had that in her slide, the indicator of a dead tree with no leaves all the way up to a nice full canopy. And then the species, I'll talk to you in a little bit. But keep in mind um, that iTree can help you to calculate the benefits provided by trees, but you don't have to have a million pieces of data. You just need to have these three. And I believe you can even do it with just two and not include condition, but while we're out there, I always have us gather at least those three variables. So one of the things we like to do is, is to map our trees and to really um, somehow locate them so you could uh, visit them again, or you can uh, put them in a report or have the uh, students observe those over time, meaning they could look at it in uh, fourth, fifth, sixth grade and see how much the tree has grown by measuring that DBH. And that's one of our uh, things we try to do is work with the kids over a several year period, um, which is nice. We get the same kids. And in, in, in one of the cases we did them for, we had the kids for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, and so the continual learning is great with them. And so the idea is, um, I think Al's line is on the line, and Al, you'll recognize uh, this is your map that you've done with our students here in Springfield, Massachusetts, where you went out to the center square, and this is Al went out and did a, um, uh, a study here using iTree uh, to look at the, the the benefits of the trees provided in a uh, downtown, a dense urban core area. But the point that I'm trying to make with this slide is, on the left uh, is, is what the students or kids might draw, or you might even draw, 
but it's an idea of converting something like this that tells a story, and you can always start to data archive things by putting that map in a three-ring binder with three-hole punch, and there you have it. Or you can take it, and if you have the, um, um, to go to the uh, effort and, and really sort of a learning experience and trying to create a great map that looks like this. And the map on the right here, Al put together for our um, citizen science program that he ran here in Springfield, Massachusetts. And in this case here, you'll see this is just done, done on Google Maps. And you'll see that each tree has an associated uh, icon and a color of, of the uh, symbol. So now you can start to look, okay, I see a bunch of purple trees. Those are calorie pears. And I see a bunch of red maples in here, okay? And I only see a couple Norway maples. And so you can start to look at species distribution. Another thing that we can talk about, but also then calculate uh, what the value, how much runoff, air, uh, water runoff is reduced from uh, rainfall, how much energy savings, how much um, particulate matter, how many, um, you know, sulfur dioxide, uh, particulate uh, micron, uh, particulate matter over 10 microns or under 10 microns in size. We can look at sodium dioxide and a variety of other things that trees provide here. But the important thing is that we're having the folks really observe, record, and report. And in this case here, this reporting um, is digital. It makes it a little bit easier uh, to go back and look at things later. And you'll see here, I just pulled up one of the trees, tree ID number 179. It's that top Norway maple. And you'll see it's a 16 inch, it's in fair condition. Um, and all of the different components of it are archived right within Google Maps. So you can create an associated um, index with each of the uh, icons that you place or your waypoints, and you can uh, really have something that's um, pretty good looking. One of the other tools that we try to do is to get folks out into the field and out observing. In this case here, we put together a uh, an outdoor scavenger hunt where each one of these icons represents a different feature of the landscape. So they're gonna be going down from, on your left here, they're gonna be in an upland forest. They go all the way down to the middle here where there's a duck pond or a stream, a wetland, and then they go back up into a uh, upland forest. So we'll have them look at various components, whether it be a habitat, whether it be looking at tree types, landscape types, um, uh, we use this for tree identification where we'll have a series of 10, 15 trees and have the folks go out and, have, and, and we set it up as a contest all the time, having the kids not to compete with each other, but just to add a little excitement to what they're doing. And that challenge of them to excel is really critical and important and uh, they seem to have a great time. With it. So we've always had good luck like that. And then here's another scavenger hunt where it's actually a little uh, challenge. And I did this one here with some folks from the International Society of Arboriculture, but it's one that I then replicated with the uh, the youth. And this is along a uh, river walk um, in in in, in um, Springfield, Massachusetts. But each step you went, you did something. So in this case here, you went to a tree and you explored where the uh, root fire was. And so you took the trowel that was there and they pulled back the mulch to find out how deep the mulch around the tree was and things like that. So we can have the kids do a, um, a bark tracing at another tree or they'll uh, trace a leaf or they'll uh, count the number of um, uh, needles on a pine tree, for instance. So we'll have them look at various components as they go along with this scavenger hunt, which is all tied into how you map things. So just using um, Google Maps, Google Earth um, can really play, pay some dividends. And here's another one. This was uh, one we do, did for a uh, winter, um, uh, winter break for some students that were in um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades or uh, middle school. And what I did is, um, and the, that's the one on the right, and the one on the left is another scavenger hunt that we do in uh, Forest Park. But this one here 
was one we did on, we called it a scavenger expedition, and we did it with uh, a, a summer camps. So every week the summer camp came in with this uh, a program called Mass in Motion. And we're lucky enough, Mass in Motion is a thing that, uh, an effort by the state of Massachusetts to get kids moving. And so one of the ways they did that is I said, well, why don't we link nature and have the kids move and explore nature? And no one, I don't know why they hadn't thought of it, but it just became a natural fit. So we've been doing this for about five years, and it's really successful because you get the kids moving, and then in the other parts of their program, they look at healthy eating, healthy living, and things like that. But our job is to get the kids moving. But my job as a Forest Service um, research scientist is to get kids exploring and learning and pressing that citizen science uh, arena. So we're making uh, helpful living with them moving and then learning a little on the environment. So the, the, that's just a, a, a map. But then you can take a map and make it and just by changing your background. And in this case here, I just put like old parchment paper. And I, I got my point locations here right off of uh, Google Earth. We're able to transfer them right onto here. And so we send the kids out on this kind of scavenger hunt, but in this case here, that one has an element of you know, an old pirate map that they found. And so one of the other things you want to do is we want to provide information for any scavenger hunt location. So these are just, um, these are actually, um, uh, eight, uh, this would be, if these were two together, it's eight and a half by 11. So we have them half of an eight and a half by 11 by sheet um, put on cardstock. And then the kids put those together and they put a three-hole punch in it. And then they use some small paracord and, and, and create their little booklet that they take out with them as they look at each scavenger hunt location once they find it. So here's one where they looked at the lakes, pond, and streams, the stop, and they looked at, and it just tells what those are. And then they had some additional information that was uh, stuck in each bottle. In this case, it was a winter one, so these green things stuck in, you know, out of the snow so they could find them. And then here's some books that um, we had prepared for the this class. We didn't have time to prepare these ourselves, so we just put them together, and I used um, carabiner clips. And so we reused these because this program we did four or five times a day. And so there's a group of the kids um, uh, heading out. These are actually my uh, interns. And this is one of uh, one of the youth that we were going out and placing the uh, the things, but uh, the um, the bottles. And the idea is to really doesn't matter what time of the year it is, or you know where you're located. You could do this in a dense urban area and hide uh, your your clues or your your um, treasures in various locations. Um, but here's just an example of trying doing it in the winter on a on a beautiful winter day. A little cold, but um, Kids have a great time. Kids don't seem to mind the weather. So there they are in the uh, the winter. And on the right, we do the same thing in sort of a geocache uh, um, type setting here with some these are gifts that we're giving out. Um, uh, and this one was done um, uh, in the summertime. So the idea is you can do this summer, winter, all the and one of the cool things, this is just, I know this is um, a component, but it's an electronic version that you can put up a scavenger hunt on a uh, smartphone. And the idea is we have a series of these, this one here on the left, off to Great Outdoors and Abbey Brook. So you go on an adventure there. Here's one Van Horn Park West. We have Van Horn Park East. We have Forest Park. We have one park. We have a whole series of these. And the way this works is you just um, have the kids uh, take a smartphone and they scan a barcode and it takes them to one of these, these bombs. Now, keep in mind, this is most likely or we've used it most successfully with high school students and young adults. But the idea is you can, once you create a, um, an electronic scavenger hunt, you have it forever. And so you can have... Uh, folks go and they and you can also set these up as a competition. So in our uh, high school camp, we had it set up as competition. And, um, the, you have to answer a question at each location. You have to find all the locations. Some of the kids, uh, we have a couple. Um, we try to make them as easy 
or we want to make them in places people find. We don't want people not finding because once you get there, there's a clue and you have to answer the question based on what you observe. So uh, that's kind of critical and that's kind of cool because we just not send them on a wild goose chase or a wild scavenger hunt. We're actually teaching them at each location. And so now here's where you go. I'm going to skip ahead here to, um, and Liza showed a little bit of this, where we're looking at a tree. And then we want to record the information. Okay, so like I said, we need to know the species condition and size. So how do you do that? Right here, you can do it, oops, sorry. You can do it on a piece of paper, or you can do it on a, um, you know, a, a, a sheet like we have on the right here, just an example that Liza showed us. But the point is, you know, one of the key things I like to use with the kids is to give them their own uh, data book. And the data book, it provides an opportunity for them to, um, you know, keep that and record it and um, uh, have that for the whole summer or for the whole school year. And you'll see just uh, here's on the right recording a, a pond. But a field book here you can get for about uh, $4 a piece. And, and they're, they're durable and they're lasting. So I'm always a big fan of data archiving like that. I get the kids to do it on paper. And in this case here, this is one we looked at, uh, where we look at soil temperature and we um, look at in the sun and out of the sun and the north and south. But the idea is it doesn't have to be done on anything fancy. And you'll see how the kids can fill things out pretty simply. So data archiving, again, we take this and you can put this in a three-ring binder. A lot of our eco data that we use for iTree Eco, I have binders in our office that have been done by youth over the years, and those we can go back and look at if we wanted to. I showed this slide the other day. Um, it's just an example of using electronic tools to collect data on a smartphone or a tablet. And the one that I like to use is Zoho Forms because it's free. It's simple, it's easy to use. And in this case here, you'll see, I just take the, uh, the data collection um, information here and you build the, um, the, the uh, interface oops, right here. And so that will, uh, by dragging and dropping, whether it be a you know, single line or um, uh, drop down menu or list, you can just go ahead and do this and then you can just access that form from your smartphone. And when you're on your smartphone, it looks something like this on the right. But you can also take a picture out there. You can record other information. But you go back on your computer. You set this up for your team, for your kids. And it's really simple. And that data is then archived forever. Um, one thing I'm talk I wanted to just try to just reiterate is we're talking about kids and turn them into citizen scientists. And one of the, pro one of the programs we use, Forest Service, um, is the gold program, or I know our part of our environmental education team uses this. It's um, a program from NASA and some of its leading partners, but there's a whole component in there to get crowdsourced citizen science data on trees. So that's just something, uh, and this is globally, so I, I encourage you to just take a look at the uh, Globe Observer program, um, which is a pretty refined and deliberate program that NASA has set up. Now, here's one of the most critical uh, parts, because without the species, you can't figure out what your trees are, um, the benefits they provide, because, you know, we, we know a small ornamental tree is only going to grow so tall, and its leaf area, its leaf area index, the size of the leaf, the number of leaves, we need to know what species it is so we can calculate that out. So, you know, I showed you this last week, and I, I believe we've already put the, um, the book in the resource. If it's not, I'll check and make sure it's there. But the idea is to have you network with the children, the kids to put in something that they can build their own tree ID book. So it doesn't have to be something as slick or as finished as what you, um, you just saw. But here they have a way of memorizing, mem remembering things when they write it down in an easy to understand way. So the one on the left, it was done by high school students, the one on the right, again, by high school students. These are a little more refined, and that's why I want to show you these examples. The younger kids, what we do is we uh, give them, um, they create their own tree ID index cards, and we'll give them the picture or a silhouette of a tree and a little description, and then 
they'll glue the pages or this, um, each of those items on uh, index cards, and then they'll tie, uh, punch a hole in it, and they'll have a little uh, collection that they have um, of tree ID. Uh, it's like having their own tree identification book, but the cost is nothing. So the idea is how can we do this simple, um, inexpensively, and in a rewarding way for the kids. And so we got the species. Once we know the size of the tree, we can start to then calculate the benefits that a tree provides. And in the U.S., we can use a thing called My Tree or a thing called iTree Design, and it's really simple. What we're going to have to do is explore some ways to get these benefits. But um, in, in India, in your case, um, through a little experimentation. So we may have to find some trees that are of like uh, stature in size and shape and maturity, and we can actually run them in um, my tree or I tree design. But the idea is that it's. Um, we're going to be able to calculate out a value of a tree. And you'll see in this case here, the ones on the left, it's just a simple number that, you know, these are ones that I made on a project in Springfield. We were working in, with the Forest Service. The one on the right is from Michigan State. So, and I know Al Zelaya from Davy and, and, and um, as a whole, Davy is big on giving these out to communities and have them really explore using iTree or using any of the uh, tools available to calculate the value of a tree. And so this one here, this is one that I made up. Um, and I have the uh, filmable PDF uh, that is going to be put on your um, Google Drive. So all you need to do in this case here is a, a spot at the top where you can type in uh, the species of tree, the total value, and the number of years and you can put your logo for your organization right in the middle. So it's a fillable PDF, and I just think that's uh, useful for some folks who just make your own, and it doesn't have to be that fancy. And these slides come from Al Zelaya, who works with uh, uh, Dr. Jenny Garden down in Australia. So, so you'll see the, um, <clears throat> the little tree benefit um, uh, report out of my tree in the middle. But what they did is she and her uh, team of volunteers down there, uh, Tree Vitalize, they were able to take this information um, and actually put the data for their uh, own um, tree text. So see, the design doesn't have to be standard. It can be any of these. And the more creative they are, and Liza showed that great picture, the one with the hands wrapping around the tree, with the, tree, the twigs being the hands, these tags don't have to be so fancy, and they can be unique. And you'll see here another one from Australia um, that they just filled these in. So one here is on habitat and food. This one here is talking about cooling costs, um, your mental and, and, and health, um, uh, physical health, property values, beach umbrellas providing a lot of shade, oxygen for three people, clean your air by removing so many grams of uh, air pollutants. So Take these and start expanding how you can engage the community in better understanding the trees and the information that um, you're going to look at and try to develop using iTree and some of the uh, other tools that are going to be uh, available to you. And Al just gave me this slide also. Al, you're online. You can open up your phone if you want to just um, mention anything here. But uh, here's just some of the feedback that they got on the trees down in Australia. And it, it, it really, oops, sorry. It really, where did my slides go? It, oops, my clicker has gone crazy. Let me go back to those. Al, are you still on? Yeah, hey, Dave, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. One one thing I wanted to mention that we've learned from um, working with Dr. Jenny Garden is that um, in the U.S. we focus a lot on the monetary values of ecosystem services, and and we have the models that are U.S. based. But for overseas users, there there are limits with that. So if you look at the tree tags that they use it gets really difficult to defend monetary values that are converted and that gets a little bit 
difficult. So they focus more on the concept of very simple things, things like the tree height, oxygen production, and, and notice how they personalize it. I am a gray box. I provide shade. I clean your air. It, it's how these trees are providing services for people. If you look at the tags that we produce in the states, it's really focusing on uh, you know a dollar fifty seven of sulfur dioxide reduction, which is uh, that's kind of difficult to digest. So it, it's taking something that's very technical and making it personal, and then also adding in those connections of things that iTree doesn't provide, like habitat, um, you know, the property value, and, and, and the mental health type connection. So it, it's just something that they've done that would, they've really made it much more creative and, and much more effective at taking technology and connecting with people. So Al, the ones right here, these are all the ones that Dr. Tenney had done working down with her folks down there, right? Yeah, that's, that's most of them service that they provide and they've expanded on and it's become really popular. Yeah, so I can see this taken off um, with the folks in, uh, in, in Delhi that we're working with today. How cool would it be if you could have your students you know, put these around the library, the school, the um, public, you know, the, the government offices, in the public park, or anywhere. This is where people can see them. So you really, this is citizen science at its best. And uh, I really, uh, oh, these these pictures. I remember you showing these in a presentation last year, and they were so powerful. And I know the folks um, that see them really get a lot of um, ideas from them. Um, Let's see if I have one more. Yeah, here's a couple more um, so you can see. And the idea here is they have uh, another map down the bottom that's uh, uh, showing you a tree trail of where you can find various trees and, again, the tree tags. So, Al, thanks for these slides. Appreciate it. And it's um, you know really a, a powerful message that folks um, can see and they can actually grasp uh, pretty easily. Um, you see the uh, the picture on the top with the, the tree trail hunt. Um, that's just another like uh, a version of what we do with our scavenger hunts, and it's just a, a great idea. And you can see it's this is from Australia, so it's being used effectively and um, you know in a in a way that folks seem to take hold of it because folks always like a challenge. The younger they are, the bigger the challenge they want to accept. And here again, this is just some from Australia, but you see the tags, kids, and then putting it into um, some kind of marketing tools or materials that folks can um, really grasp hold of and utilize. And then this is a version, I like this on the right of uh, Jenny's trees, except instead of having the leaves, they have the, uh, and these all come from, I mean, Eliza's trees, these all come from Jenny uh, down in Australia, but it's kind of cool because each kid puts their um, their thoughts about a tree and personalizes the tree that they have in the classroom door. So it's kind of cool, and here they are just not too young and uh, out there measuring. Um, and in this case here, they have a little more money than we do, so they're using some tools that they actually were able to purchase. And in our case here, we're trying to help you to make some things that are inexpensive. So I, I, I want to get down, I only, we only have a little bit of time left, but I want to just mention to you iTree Canopy. I know many of you are familiar with that, um, and that's one of the key ones that we're using um, that's going to help you to be able to look at um, the structure, function, and value of the forest around you or the, around the areas where the, you're working, whether it be the whole town, the whole city, a neighborhood, or... Um, uh, school uh, school grounds, and then the other one is iTree Eco. So let me just get into these because we don't have a ton of time left. But here is our iTree canopy, and you'll see here I've just uh, highlighted a, a neighborhood, and um, you'll see all the tree points. So what you do is you uh, go, and I know many of you have used this, so I'm just showing you quickly, and we'll we might get into this a little bit later. But there's your impervious grass, buildings, trees, things like that. And so you're able then to report out in a uh, summary. And then from that summary, you can also 
um, produce another tool here that communicates what you've done. So it's data collection, data archiving, and then telling your story or reporting out. And that's the theme that I try to teach our students is you're going to collect, you're going to measure something, you're going to count it, you're going to weigh it, you're going to do something, but then we're going to record it in your date book or your log book, and then we're going to report it out in a way that folks can understand it. And it can be, you know, in a science fair type setting, it can be in a handout, it can be just in, in simple, simple um, uh, things like the, the, the paper trees that you make and you can show that uh, communication of what you've been looking at. So I think that's pretty cool. And so then we're going to look a little bit about, and I'm going to put in the, um, the website here, um, when you collect the information, it's all local information. So you're going to collect the species data, and then what we're hoping is that we can take some of that species data that you provide to us by giving us the uh, um, the species, the size, and the condition, and then we can take that and try to uh, input the data into iTree Eco, and then get some reporting for you based on on the conditions and the localized uh, data from Delhi. And so we've um, that you don't have to go into Eco and produce the uh, data, but we'll show you the final um, querying of the reporting that you can do. And then we'll demonstrate um, in um, how to do that uh, once we have some real data delivered by you. And I'm going to report that out um, during the week of our final presentations. So, and, and, and we'll get into that in a minute too um, on what we need to do for that. But we're going to work individually with you um, if you want to explore iTree Eco iTree Canopy, you should be able to explore on your own as is right online. And so here's some of the uh, um, data you need to collect, but in our case, we're just going to have you collect species, size, and condition. And if you, um, that's going to be enough for us to run our eco analysis. And just here's some reporting of how we use this internationally, but this was using iTree. Uh, Eco and iTree Canopy to report in places, and I showed you the slide last week, but in Canada, Great Britain, and um, in, in Santo Domingo. So the idea is uh, the information that you're collecting, that you're going to teach the kids to collect, can be processed, reported out, and you're going to be part of the whole science community. So let me just finish and wrap up right here. I was looking at the big picture all the way down to looking at the, the um, the uh, individual tree, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of material you're trying to cover, and you, we find that it's easiest if I just don't come in and start scaring people by, we're going to use iTree. And that's why I think um, we want to start to introduce the kids um, into this by having a couple of good adventures that they can do, whether it be making a, uh, you know, a weather vane or making a rain gauge, and then possibly going on a scavenger hunt, and then that scavenger hunt will expand to a real scientific expedition where they're going to be collecting information on the school ground, their neighborhood, or the, 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 the community that they live in um, using iTree Canopy and iTree Eco. So I think I'm going to wrap up right there. Um, is that okay, Liza, or uh, Allison? Who's telling me that I, I presented enough? Yeah, that sounds great. I noticed we have a question from Akshat in the chat box. Akshat, do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Hello, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, yes. perfect. Yeah, I was asking that. So one of the problems that I've seen, I've observed while uh, working with uh, uh, the the iTree data collection link is that if you actually click on, clear, click on back while collecting data, uh, you lose all the data that is collected. And sometimes if you have a bad internet connection and if your uh, net goes off, then again you lose the data. So are Zoho forms a better alternative uh, to data collection? And can you collect? So in in the iTree mobile uh, link collection, I think you can. You have a button in which you click, and you, it automatically takes latitude and longitude. 
So is there a similar thing in Zoho, which by which you can collect the latitude and longitude of the tree? Um, on the Zoho survey, it it holds it in a cache, so I haven't lost any data yet. Um, it because um, I'll go out where I don't have uh, so I, I, without a cellular connection, and it holds it in a cache. And when I get to my networking, it uploads that at once, but it holds it in in, in a cache, I believe, in the memory on my iPad. If that makes sense. Um, but there's certainly a great opportunity when you use paper and pencil, paper and pen. Um, that you don't lose your data, and you know, with kids, um, it seems they they enjoy working with uh, pen and paper, pencil and paper. Uh, they do enjoy the technology, but when they're out in the field looking and observing, sometimes it really uh, gets them intrigued when they get their own little field book. You know, that's one of the key things. This is your sort of this is your guidebook, and it's yours to keep for the the duration of our program. And in our case, we go 14 weeks with them. So we have a great opportunity to um, have them fill those books up and then they keep those. I don't know whether they treasure them or they throw them away, but I think most of the kids that I've seen, it's something they hold near and dear to them. Hey Dave, this is uh, Al. I've been, I wanted to comment on Akshat's question. I've been uh, experimenting with another online tool called EpiCollect, and, and Akshat has actually sent me some species and school names, and I'm, I'm trying to see if I can use that to create something very simple, just to collect, uh, say, maybe 20 tree species and, and using common names in Delhi, and that does have the ability to collect uh, GPS coordinates. So, so probably within a week or so, I'll have uh, you know proof of concept to to share with you all to see if that'll work. And and the idea being that you can collect simple data, uh, as you said, Dave, uh, tree species, diameter, condition, and and optional things like height if you like, and and then you can import that into iTree eco to get some of the ecosystem services but it, it's just an, another tool really to um, maybe simplify data collection so that could be viable yeah. if uh, zoho forms doesn't work yeah and and uh, actually i just i'm looking on zoho forms i'll try to find the answer i just it i think it can grab your you know that latitude and longitude as a you know grab of the point location just as part of the function of a smartphone and GPS, but we'll find that out for you. The only reason I use Zoho Forms is um, it's it's sort of um, public domain, and the, the form one is free. So, uh, Al, which one are you using? Uh, EpiCollect. That, Epi that's Collect. also free. Yeah. Okay, so you uh, the, the folks on the team. You might want to look at both of those and see which one you might prefer, but the, I like them because you can then just, and it, especially for the high school kids, you can just uh, create a uh, an application, um, a form that they can just open on their smartphone or on the tablet PC or on an iPad. And it works out terrific for them. The young kids, not so much. There it is. Thanks, Anja. Great. Well, thanks everyone for um, for staying with us. I know we're right up on at eleven. Um, but just quickly before we close, um, I'm just going to give a quick overview of what we're looking for next. So, talking a bit about your projects. Um, We'll ask you to save the date for July 24th. That's when we'll be presenting um, or we'll be seeing your presentations. We'll ask for one per organization, but encourage you each to have your own idea of what a project might look like integrating iTree concepts um, while you work with young children. Um, and you can feel free to use this template. We'll share it with you all after the presentation. Um, as far as timing, we'll ask for an eight-minute presentation so we can have quite a bit of discussion afterwards. 
Um, uh, Liza, were we going to vent? Oh, there you go. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so a little bit of what exactly we're looking for in these projects. Um, we'll ask for a target audience or age group, whether it's young children, high school aged, or even up to university aged. Um, how long will the will the experience be? Will it be once, twice, um, scaffolded? What are your objectives? What are you hoping to accomplish in this project? Um, and what challenges might you face? Do you need any expertise from our resource experts or other Delhi Urban Network members? And we're always here for you if you need some help. We're having an office hours um, the week of July 6th. We welcome you to schedule a time with Liza, Dr. Dave, or myself, um, just to brainstorm ideas if you have any questions, um, or just to talk about what your projects might look like. We're always available via email or WhatsApp. Yeah, and, and, um, and yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to mention on that week of July 6th, so um, we'll get you the mechanism for how you can choose a time. Um, and we'd be happy to spend as much time as you need to try to sort out uh, how you put your project together and what you're going to report out or assistance that you might need. Um, but we'll have plenty of time between the, the week of July 6th and the 24th to um, you'll, you'll have plenty of time to pull your project together and um, really fine tune what you're going to present. So uh, whether it be data collecting or um, just putting together whatever you um, are going to do. So there's plenty of time. So don't feel rushed is what I'm getting at. Yeah, and we welcome creativity too. I know we've we've learned so much from Liza, Mike, and Dr. Dave on creative ways to engage kids and we know that you all are also doing um, doing this work in Delhi, so we welcome creative ideas. I think with that, we can open it up to more questions if people have time to stay on. Allison, do you mind just running through quickly the template just sure. so that they can see? Yeah, of course. Um, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Thank you to Liza for putting this together. Um, I think it's about eight slides. Sorry, I'm getting a lag with my. Do it. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. So talking a bit about the objectives, what are you hoping to accomplish? Um, what are the learning objectives? What will it look like? Um, are we looking for exposure or hands-on activities? I think um, when we talked, uh, I think we figured the ideal way to do this is you're going to have about eight minutes to present, and then we'll have seven minutes for discussion. Is that how we have it planned? I think so. Um, if you go over, uh, you know, a little bit, that's fine, or you're a little under, that's fine. You have the 15 minutes, so, um, but keep in mind eight, and I think um, um, Allison has the eight slides here. If you had eight slides, one a minute, you'd be in good shape. Yeah, and then a little bit about resources and materials. What might you need for a project? I'm sorry, my slides aren't We'll have all today. of this on the Google Drive and send you guys a link. There should be, for the template itself, we have eight. Again, you can add pictures to this. Um, you don't even have to use the template. We just want to hear what your thoughts are um, on your engagement of youth um, and your plan moving forward. And I think um, Allison might be in the interest of time. We'll just put this up on the on the Google Drive so all of you have access to it. And I know we're running behind, but we um, want to continue this 
discussion offline if anybody has questions on any of the presenters today and any of the presentations, I mean, or anything for Al and Jason or Allison, please uh, feel free to send us an email and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And, or you can just schedule time with us. We're, we're always here. And Mike also, sorry. Thanks. Yes, thanks yeah, for Mike joining us today, sorry. everybody. I, I think we should include Mike in the office hours because he has some great ideas, but I know you're crazy. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's do that. Mike, once you, once you get on this train, you can't get off. So that's the best part of it. That's what happened to me with Monarch Butterflies 15, 16 years ago. <laughs> once I got on and the me, wings, I couldn't get off. That happened to me with iTree 12 years ago, whatever. It doesn't, it's all good. We're having fun. <laughs> so, but uh, we're excited. I'm excited to be able to see what everyone develops as as their ideas, their projects, and I'm excited to uh, meet with you individually as you have uh, questions. If I can help on any of the i tree, and I know Al's in the wings. I know he's um, he's in Hot Florida, but maybe he would be available if I can't answer a question. I'm sure that um, he will know where to find the answer, and probably knows it. So. And you have a great um, array of resources within that network, uh, Akshat with iTree, um, Ashim has used iNaturalist and has done things with uh, kids, and I believe um, People Bob and Akshat with Gimme Trees Trust, they do a lot of work engaging youth. Um, Arav is a goodwill ambassador to the sustainable, develop, sustainable Development Goals, and he's only 11, so, you know, He's a young scientist and teacher as well. And, um, you know, and just I, make sure to, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I almost forgot Jason Henning is on, who's part of our Forest Service team. And I know um, if we can't answer a question that Jason could help us out a little bit. And also, Jason, feel free to do a, a final project for the class if you'd like, because, uh, you know, I know you work with your son. You showed us some pictures of that in one of your presentations that I recently saw. So I know um, you're exploring the natural world with him, so. Well, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today um, and Allison for keeping us moving and for sending out all the information. So stay tuned for more coming up. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks okay. everyone. Isa, we'll see you Monday. See you Monday. Okay, Take care. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you very right. much. Thanks, Caitlin, for joining us. Okay. Bye, Balaji. Bye, Balaji. Mike, great work with you on this. Hopefully, you'll be staying around. <laughs> well, take care, Dave. Bye, Katie Lynn. Bye, bye. Katie Lynn, for joining. Okay. Nope. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. I'll see ya. Thank Good you. job. Good job. Bye. Oh, it's Friday. It's Friday. Have a good weekend. Happy Friday. Friday. Yeah, you okay. too. Bye. Okay, bye bye.